Thank you very much, Sean. Um, just on a on a minor point, I keep hearing Sean greeting all the ladies and gentlemen this morning. I actually took a sneak peek at the attendees, and yes, welcome to the ladies as well. I never realised um, it's a good thing I had my my language check in 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 place. I never realised we had so many ladies joining us in the morning. Welcome to you guys as well. This morning, our topic: grease traps. Um, Last time around, we spoke about car washes. Um, it is something that has become a bit of a hassle. It is something that the municipalities are battling with, and it's actually something that the plumbers out there could use as a tool or could use as an extra source of income. So let's dip straight into it and see how far we get. Let's start off by saying that the Water Services Act, which is probably, as far as plumbers concerned, um, at the top of the triangle, um, it specifically says that the minister may from time to time prescribe compulsory national standards relating to the provision of water services. And then the one we're looking at for today, the quality of water taken from or discharged into any water services or water resource system. In other words, it's not only about taking um, clean water or allowing or providing for clean water to be taken. It's also about what you discharge into a water service. And then the rest of it, all of this is up to the municipalities and making sure that the water service providers tow the line. Then we take a slight step down and we go on to where our plumbing bit starts and we go to the National Building Regulations Part P says, where any person has obtained approval to discharge into any drain, any liquid or solid matter other than soil water and wastewater and where any additional drainage and any other installations, including storage, pretreatment, and metering installations are required by the local authority as a condition. Such person shall submit plans and details of such an installation required by the municipality. And that installation shall then be constructed in accordance with these regulations and shall be maintained in good working order. It is imperative. Um, when we're looking at maintenance on these things, we were called in, in Nelson Mandela Bay Metro about a week or two ago. The owner of a premises was fined 300,000 Rand for polluting a river. They had a, a, a trap that wasn't maintained and it started bypassing and overflowing and it ended up in the Swartkops River and they were fined 300,000 Rand. Now, I don't know about the rates when you do maintenance, but um, I'm sure we'll be able to maintain it for less than that. Any person who constructs an installation contemplated in sub-regulation one, in other words, what we've just looked at, other than in accordance with that approval, shall be guilty of an offense. So because they took it from the building regulations and they dragged the, the local bylaws into it, it was easy enough to issue a fine for non-compliance. We take another step down to our application of the national building regulations and it says specifically that a suitable grease trap shall be provided to take discharge of wastewater from a sink or other fixture in any building where wastewater is to be discharged to a french drain in other words if you do have a kitchen or you are discharging into a french drain in an outlying area or an area without waterborne sewerage you are supposed to have a grease trap instead of having the grease blocking up your, your soak away or your French drain and causing it to malfunction, or where the discharge of grease, oil, or fat may, might cause an obstruction to the flow in a drain or the sewer, or it might interfere with the efficient operation of a sewage disposal system. It's not only about getting the sewage there, it's also about how the sewage gets treated. Um, any of those foreign materials, uh, grease, oil, and fat, it actually influences the water that gets discharged. sorry about that, uh, that gets discharged from that sewage disposal system. And then it shall be designed and constructed to have a removable lid or cover, which shall permit the effective removal of grease, oil, fat, or solid matter. Then it says, uh, just a note, the accumulation of grease, oil, and fat 
or solid matter in a grease trap should be regularly removed to ensure the effective operation of that trap. Straightforward. It says in so many words, if you are going to be putting it in, you need to make sure that you are going to maintain it. Then we get to the working bit, the, the 10 to 5 2 part 2, the uh, installation standard for drainage. A grease interceptor shall be provided to take discharge from any sanitary fixture or appliance where the discharge of fixture or appliance could, con could contain grease, fat or vegetable oil where that discharge directly into a fringe drain or in quantities that could cause an obstruction to the flow in the drain or interfere with the efficient operation of the sewage system. So you see, even when we skip the 10400 part P as plumbers, we're looking at 10252, which is our code of practice. It still explains you the same thing again. Any grease interceptor required for a given building or commercial establishment shall serve only that building or establishment. So if you have a, a, a shopping center with 20 line shops of which 10 of them are in the food court, you'll have 10 separate grease traps. Only that building or establishment that is draining through that. You can't have various companies or various, um, let's call them takeaway shops for that matter, discharge through the same, each one onto their own. There are two types that you can get. The one is the one that uh, is shown here. It is for inside installation, small restaurants and other similar establishments that could generate small amounts of grease would most likely use a grease interceptor that's installed inside the building or room. And such grease interceptor would normally be a factory constructed unit, normally stainless steel or uh, uh, glass fiber, depending on the heat. Um, and it may be constructed that it be floor mounted or installed below the floor. Most of them, you'll find some of them are so small that if you're using these big catering sinks, some of those units actually fit on that shelf under the sink as well. The design of such units should provide means to ensure that the flow of wastewater at no time exceeds the rated capacity of the unit. So you want to make sure you don't discharge more into that system than what is that is than what it's capable of carrying. Then the next one you're looking at for commercial or larger establishments that generate large volumes of wastewater containing grease and fat accumulations. They require grease interceptors to be located outside, although smaller grease traps may also be located outside. You'll find that a lot of the shopping centers, especially the bigger malls, they require their tenants to have their own grease trap, clean out their own systems, but then they still end up having one of these monsters outside and I've spent many a day cleaning these things. These things are hectic. If if you do not have that pre-cleaning or that pre-little grease trap inside the unit that the tenant opens up and you end up having, you get a call out to a certain shopping center or certain uh, uh, location knowing that you're going to spend the better part of a day cleaning out that trap. Any grease interceptor shall be located that it's easily accessible for inspection and cleaning and that intercepted fat, grease and oil can be removed hygienically. The location shall be such that there will be no need for, to use ladders or bulky objects to check or service it and it'd be possible to completely empty and clean that interceptor. And then just a note on the construction, unless otherwise approved, a grease interceptor situated below ground outside the building shall be located, not, with, not be located within one meter from that building. It's basically just because you're digging a hole, you don't want any pressure from the building or the foundations, or you don't want to end up undermining the foundations of that building. And then just a quick comment on that same subject. The interceptor should achieve maximum efficiency in promoting cooling, coagulation, and retention of the grease within the separation compartment. And interceptors that do not serve single dwelling units should be designed to produce a separation of 92% and then store at least 40 liters of light substances. So it needs to be a decently sized unit. And the size of that interceptor should be such that the velocity of flow of the water through the interceptor allows the grease to separate. You don't want to end up putting a small unit in there. And then when the water comes gushing through there, it actually washes all the, the grease and fat through the system. You want to size this thing properly. There is a, a table that you can use for the amount of flow being generated from each of these establishments. And then you can work it from there. Then point four says the temperature of the water at the outlet from the grease interceptor should not exceed 30 degrees in order to allow grease and fat. So if you have a big enough volume and you have cold water in there and someone flushes a sink, you'll find that 
the water comes in here, the solids and the spoons and whatever straws, whatever foreign material you pick up will go into this basket and it will go through and end up in here. And at a slow enough rate, you'll see as it cools down, all the fat and all the grease and that starts staying behind. And at 30 degrees on the outlet side, that would be nice and cool enough for all the gunk to stay behind and the water or the wastewater to then go down to the drainage system. Just uh, the, the next note says, all parts of that interceptor, including in outlet sockets, shall be easily accessible for cleaning purposes. The interceptor shall be fitted with a removable lid and a manual cover that permits easy and effective removal of that grease fat, solid matter, or fine sludge. And it seals airtight. Any grease interceptor shall be vented to prevent it from becoming airlocked. The design and construction of the interceptor shall be such that the airspace, so basically what it says is if you look at this little detail, okay, you need airspace in here. So just like you vent a drain, you'll find that on that outlet side when this, drain, when this thing discharges into the drain, you need a bit of air in it or you need air in that top section of the unit to actually allow that drain to flow. So there's nothing major or nothing additional required. It's just at construction when you look at the detail of it, you need this thing, you can't have a bend here that actually sits here and it siphons the water here without having some air to let the drain run properly. And then, the reason for this morning's talk is to prevent that. You can see when it gets really bad, you end up taking out part of drainage system or you end up taking out lines because you can't get a drain rod through there. Some of these jetting machines start bubbling around these systems here, that you will not jet away. You'll jet it into something else or to another position, but that won't go away. So there's a typical arrangement of inside a kitchen, under the sink or inside the building. Important to note, you get various models. You'll see this one's got a little light liquid interceptor like we did with the car washers. So whatever oil in that gets collected, simply when it gets to that top level and it gets high enough, it actually discharges and that they can go and empty or when they collect the other oil drums from the catering side or from the, the, the food prep side, you simply add that with the rest of it. When you do your marketing or when you do your, your chat to your prospective client or when you approach someone to say look we need to have a look at your center grease traps or we need to do x y and z um, it's important to note you'll see that this mess is actually inside the kitchen where they're prepping your breakfast or your lunch or your supper wherever you're going out for a meal um, important to note that this is actually inside that once this thing overflows and it pollutes the kitchen and it runs all over the floor and that the chances are about 99% that the health department would close that place down until it's cleaned up altogether proper like a new shop. So you don't want your client to get into a position where they actually end up having hassles um, operating because they never did an hour's worth of work or they never did uh, the cleaning of a grease trap. And it happens. You'll be amazed. At, as easy as what it is to maintain these things, how, how often these units cause buildings to, to close down because once it's spilt on the floor and once there's um, fat and little bits and pieces all over it, the health department won't have yourself takeaways or food from that venue there. So when wow. you do talk to the guys or you talk to the owners of these buildings, just make sure that they understand that it's easy enough to maintain. It's difficult enough to do the cleaning up afterwards. And then just before we hit the local authority side, you'll find that there's a lot of products out there you get some nice apple flavored ones and you'll see they straightforward. You don't even have to remember. It's called grease trap treatment. Uh, enzymes, you get various, like I say, flavors, models, makes environmentally friendly, some more, but a bit more harsh. You end up putting that into that uh, um, unit when you're cleaning it. It actually helps dissolve all the rest of the, the um, foreign material. And then when you do flush it down the system, it ends up going down there as, a, as something that would be um, acceptable to the council. So while we're on the subject of the council, you'll find that there's a, um, a number of ones that I keep picking on because I've got them. I'm still collecting some more, but if you look at Joburg's water and sanitation bylaws, you'll see that point F there says, uh, no person may discharge or cause or permit the discharge or entry into the sewer of any sewage 
industrial effluent or liquid or substance which contains any material or what of whatsoever nature including oil grease fat or detergents capable of causing an obstruction in the flow to a drain or interference with the proper operation of a sewage treatment plant and then what they do is and we'll have a look at two or three of them from that same Joburg document you'll find that when it comes to the trade effluent gas, in other words, the gas that sample your, your effluent when from shopping centers and industrial buildings, it actually tells you there that subject to the provisions of this water services bylaw, the following limits will apply. The maximum concentration limit of substances contained in any sewage, effluent, or dis liquid discharge. Substances in solution including fat, grease, wax, and that. You can see 200 milligrams per liter. We'll have a look at that now. Here's another one, can't show any visible signs of oil, tar or associated products, bitumen, asphalt, emulsions, emulsions of oil. And from that table you can see sewage standards, they've got temperatures there, so you've got all these other requirements and then they, the one that says fat, fat, vegetable oil and like substances or mineral oils, 450 milligram per liter. I'm not a, a baker or I'm not a, a, a a culinary person, but uh, if I understand um, University of Google correct, 450 milligram is around 0.45 milliliters, which is in, in reality, it's about 10% of a teaspoon. A teaspoon would give you 4.5 uh, milliliters, so about 5 milliliters on a teaspoon. So you're looking at 10% of a teaspoon per liter of water. Anything more than that, you're bound to get a fine or you're bound to get hauled over the coals for your discharge. Same thing happens in the Paul area in Drakenstein. You'll find that they actually go and they specify on their minor or their, the size of the treatment works that you discharge to. They have different requirements for different things, but you'll see the fat, whether it's big or small, huge treatment works bigger than 25 megaliters a day or smaller, the same thing applies. Worcester, Breda Valley, only thing I'd like to mention in that there is they've actually got their standards for the effluent down to a T. The norms, standards, and guidelines contemplated in subsection one, which is up here, may differentiate between communities, geographical areas, and different kinds of premises. So instead of having one fixed um, value to that discharge that you allowed, they actually tell you that it differs from one end to the other or from one area to another. And then any person who then wants to discharge then needs to contact the municipality and they will give you the value for the discharge that you actually allowed to have into the sewer. Just in case the guys in Durban area were sleeping, Itaqueni tells you exactly the same thing. Pombella, exactly the same thing. So it's a, it's, you can see it starts from the Water Services Act. It comes all the way down to the municipal bylaws. There's a continuous reference of if you want to have a drain working properly or you want a drain to actually perform satisfactorily, keep it clean. Go around to the shopping center. Some of them might not even have maintenance plans. Some of them might not even be aware of the bigger ones outside. Approach them, make sure that in the area where you work, that guys are aware that these things, the discharge of these things are actually illegal and they, they could actually, if you take a copy of your local bylaws, you could actually explain to them that they could expose themselves to some major fines if they do get caught out. So that's my little bit about grease traps and their possible functions and non-functions. Have we got any questions, Sean? We have got one question here on the list. I'll go ahead and okay. read it to you. It reads, look at the picture of the grease trap in the kitchen. There are no more, there are no traps on the piping below the sinks. With those types of stainless steel traps, do they stop bad odor, or is that just a mistake on the installation? A very good question. No, that is these units. Uh, you'll see these fins have actually got. Uh, sorry, wrong picture. There we go. So you've got an inlet, and the water goes in here, and that whole unit. That basket and that unit becomes the trap. This outlet sits at low level in the water and it runs out the other side. So that whole unit filled with water, you'll see it comes in, there's a fin. So that there's no break below that fin. 
and there's no there's no oh, sorry I say fin separator um, there's no air going through that whole system whatsoever you see if you end up with a trap before that you end up filling the trap with solids in it and half of it get, will get stuck in the trap before it actually heats these things and so yeah most definitely that yeah these are it, it looks funny but this unit is considered a trap so no problem there all right perfect that's all of the questions i have got for you this morning would you like to go ahead and end off uh very easy morning then for me guys do enjoy the rest of your day make sure keep it safe and then we'll see each other or we'll see one of our other presenters next week thursday morning keep it safe out there perfect 100% thanks so much ladies and gentlemen for joining us this morning i'm going to go ahead and end off the um, session please do remember the survey on the way out and enjoy the rest of your week guys thanks so much again bye bye